I mean, economists, they look at the capital, they look at the labor, they look at human creativity, and they say, we will extract the resources that we need and get the energy that we need to grow our societies, to grow our GDP. They assume that there will always be availability of these resources, and they don't even consider the the energy is behind everything. And, and that's pretty clear in this paper that the energy and the quality of the energy and the ease at which we can extract the energy is the key behind our entire civilization, behind everything. Welcome to another Climate Emergency Forum discussion. Tonight, superorganism or super predator? Well, that's the question we're going to try to answer. And we hope that if we don't come up with an answer, maybe you'll let us know. I'm here today to lead you through the topic of economics for the future, beyond the superorganism. A paper written by Nate Hagens about this very topic. It's quite fascinating. It may seem a bit dense. It's a very interesting way of looking at humanity, society, and our economic system. I'm going to give a brief overview, and we'll have some greater explication by Peter and Paul. And I kind of want to start off by discussing this idea of, of what is a superorganism. Uh, you can kind of think of it as a biological structure or kind of thinking of, of a species, for example, interrelating with its environment and creating what you might see as like this living entity. So humans, for example, are, we're more than just one human. We're more than just a few humans. We're an entire collective interacting with our environment. And I want to talk about how this affects modern man, modern person. Now, one of the authors that I did a little research in and trying to understand this paper was Lisi Kral. She spoke about the economic superorganism, and we'll put some information about her in the description as well. She talked a lot about how agriculture changed humanity, how prior to the discovery of agriculture and how we act upon the land to create what it is that we need to live changed us forever. This was about 10,000 years ago. Prior to that, we lived very differently. We were hunter-gatherers for most of our existence prior to that. We went with the rhythms of the planet we went to where it was warmer, where it was cooler, where there was food, where there are more or less rains. We interacted with the planet rather than acting upon it, which is exactly what we're doing now. And so this has changed how we see the earth. We see the earth sort of as a commodification machine. It's going to continually churn out what we need. This has been much to the demise of the planet and us. Now, it's it's interesting because in many ways we can say, well, this has made our life so much better. You know, we're able to like stay in one region. And, you know, I live in New York State. I have a home and I have a place where I go for work. But for modern man, while there's there so many conveniences, there's so many different types of flavored waters, it really brings a great deal of unhappiness upon us. There's so many different forms of unhappiness. Well, for one thing, there's the separation between us and the planet. Well, you may say, well, heck, we're working in the fields. We're creating our own food. This is not the case. In the 1930s, John Steinbeck talked about the mechanization of farming and agriculture. And well, you know, against this backdrop, we had the Great Dust Bowl, the overworking of the earth, the mechanization of extraction. So it brought us a great deal of unhappiness. 
um, because we are moving away from our natural rhythms. And what I liked that was so gracefully spoken about in this particular paper was how this has brought us to a point of almost rapaciousness. That is, we are not satisfied prior to this era of when we demanded fields from the earth, when we went and got what it was as a group of humans, we had a full signal. We had an on signal. I'm hungry. We had an off signal. I'm no longer hungry. Now we have no off signal. And what we want is more, more, more. And of course, this is amplified by technology. And this has all led humanity to a place of great unhappiness. And so there's a lot to work with there. And I really want to hear your thoughts, Peter, on this, this whole mishigash that we find ourselves in. Thank you. I, I found the article uh, quite challenging. Like you and Fur, I, I really like the idea of reflecting back a long, long way in the history and the story of humanity. And I like that because right now, I think it's very clear to most of us that we have lost our way. And as you say, we have made this huge transformation in being interdependent with nature as a hunter-gatherer, right? But uh, over the past, well, a few hundred years at least, but I think it probably started with the scientific revolution, that we have progressively separated ourselves more and more and more from nature. And so, you know, when I look back on my lifetime, uh, I'm very conscious of a theme of conquest, right? The conquest of nature, the conquest of the oceans, the conquest of the forest, the conquest of the highest hills. And I don't think that's a very uh, good mythology. I don't think that's a very helpful mythology at all. Where are we today, though, with, with our culture? Well, I, I came across just a few days ago some absolutely startling numbers. Now, I don't usually use numbers because I'm not very good at them, but this is the global debt. I think this will absolutely amaze you. I was uh, at the Carnegie Peace Institute, and I found an article on global debt. Well, the global debt now is almost $300 trillion. $300 trillion of debt, right, that our particular humanity society today has taken on. And, of course, the thing that I think is really, really bad about that is that we're actually taking it from the future because it's debt. But $300 trillion is really out of hand. And it's grown in the past year or two over 300%. It's, it's, it, there's a lot of things that I see in our way of life, which strike me as being absolutely insane, but, but that's real insanity. This particular article said that this extraordinary high level of debt is a 30% rise in global GDP. I've always been interested in global GDP because uh, I think that's a, a reflection of, you know, how, how well we function. So I want to interrupt myself and say that there's only one superorganism, right? And, and that's the superorganism that uh, hunter-gatherers and the early uh, farmers and pastoralists were aware of. And of course, that's always been called Mother Nature or Mother Earth. And we don't use that term anymore. The indigenous people do. But the term Mother Nature that I grew up with in England, that's really not in our language anymore. And um, that's, a, that's a huge and, I think, fatal loss. A uh, few other numbers, which I have been uh, sadly aware of um, over many years, is that world military spending is over $2 trillion. If there's anything that characterizes our society, our culture, if you really look at the history, and you can go back hundreds of years here, it is war. That's really the main thing that characterizes what we're about. And it's very much about how the nation states formed. And I am absolutely, um, I feel profoundly um, almost a sense of despair because of what's happening in the middle of Europe today. And uh, this is as horrible and as bloody as the Rand Corporation even says, as, as war gets. But I'm really shocked that how we have sort of very easily sort of as a society um, sort of gone in with this war. It's very sad, very, very sad. So world military spending um, has reached over three, $2 trillion for the first time. So that says, um, you know, mountains, right? 
So we're probably aware that for the first time, the U.S. defense budget is over $800 billion. It's probably approaching $850 billion. But get this. I went to the U.S. Department of Defense, and they say that actually they have $1.73 trillion. So they say that the American government has assured them of $1.7 trillion should they need it in the year of 2023. So I think we have to go back. We should go back to the sort of 70s and 80s consciousness. But a lot of people are still doing it, but nowhere near enough of um, trying to get back into a consciousness with nature. I just want to say something very, very quickly. Uh, a long time ago, I went to a lecture given. It was a creation care group. And creation care, I think, is a, is a wonderful uh, consciousness sense. And it was a philosopher, a Catholic priest. And he started off his lecture and says, well, if I ask you how long sort of you had been around, humanity, human race and culture, he said, you'd probably say maybe 150 years. So, um, but he said, no, you know, you know how long we've been around? He said, we've been around 4 million years. So he took us right back to Homo erectus and beyond. And it, it, was, just, it was a really mind-blowing, mind-expanding lecture that he gave. And I, I come out, came out of it feeling um, much better, actually, and much more powerful, in a sense. We really disempowered ourselves as individualizing ourselves so much and separating ourselves from what is obviously best everywhere, which is the beauty of nature. And um, I think we must dwell and, and meditate and, and contemplate that and try and find our way back because we are on a suicidal course. So change needs to be immediate. Agreed so much, Peter. I so agree with you that duality between us and the planet is such a destructive force. You know, one of the things that uh, I'll bring her up again, Lisey Crawl brings up is uh, with agriculture, we were able to stay in place. And because of that, we were able to become more expansive in terms of geographics, but also in terms of offspring. So we've really just, there are too many humans. So my thing is with this whole economic system we've created, how do we go back? And I'm interested, I know, Paul, that you're probably going to talk about not just the economics, but also in terms of the energy of economics. And I'm interested to hear that perspective as well. Thank you, Regina and, and Peter. I like the quote that is given in this, that Nate Hagen's put in his paper, The Economics for the Future Beyond Superorganism. The quote by E.O. Wilson, which says, the real problem of humanity is the following. We have Paleolithic emotions, medieval institutions, and godlike technology. It's interesting if you look at the evolution of the human mind, because as we came out of the forest, you know, as we transferred from hunter-gatherers, it was a climate thing, right? You know, the peak of the last ice age was 21,000 years ago, then it was warming. About 11,000 years ago, climate was warm enough, and we consider this the, the Holocene period. We've now moved into the Anthropocene, human-centered changes. But the previous 100,000 years to the 11,000-year-ago period was colder, and it was harder to grow things. It was harder to survive because it was a colder environment, and there was climate instability. CO2 levels were lower. We were hunter-gatherers, and that was from about, three, say, 300,000 years ago or so. It might go back a bit. Wait, that's as homo sapiens. Before then, of course, Peter said, goes back three or four million years ago, as Peter said. But when agriculture started to develop, I didn't realize this. Um, we think of it developing just in the Fertile Crescent. But it, according to the paper, it actually developed in seven separate locations simultaneously around the world. You know, we started to realize that we could actually get seeds, save some seeds from year to year. We could plant, we could grow, we could start agriculture. We started domesticating animals and it happened simultaneously in different regions. And it allowed us to start specializing. Not everybody had to go and gather food, right? Some people could actually have time to think a bit and the communication levels went way up. You know, our brains kind of 
started evolving. They built up, like parts of the brain didn't just be replaced by other parts. As, it w- as we were evolving, our brain built up different levels. And we still have this basic stone age or lizard type parts of the brain, which actually can dominate the rational part of the brain quite often, especially in times when we're fearful, et cetera. The sort of limbic system, lower brain stem system can actually control what we do in certain situations and suppress rational thought. As we developed, we got more and more specialization and we started to, as Regina, as you were saying, we started to have these notions that we wanted more and more and more, right? We weren't satisfied with what we had. There always had to be growth. There always had to be progress. And of course, there were human history is in a straight trajectory. There were wars, there were famines that, that took out a lot of people, set humans back. But, you know, the trend is was always upward. And this is carried to modern day to the economists. I mean, economists, they look at the capital, they look at the labor, they look at human creativity, and they say, we will extract the resources that we need and get the energy that we need to grow our societies, to grow our GDP. They assume that there will always be availability of these resources, and they don't even consider the the energy is behind everything. And, And that's pretty clear in this paper that the energy and the quality of the energy and the ease at which we can extract the energy is the key behind our entire civilization, behind everything. And I love the striking example. If you have a person working for a day and compare that amount of energy with the energy in a barrel of oil, the person would have to work at manual labor for 11 years to match the amount of energy in one barrel of oil. So once we were able to extract fossil fuels, whether it be coal from the ground, then oil, gas, et cetera. There's so much energy, chemical energy content compared to human labor. So our whole society built up on these fossil fuels. And that's why it's so darn hard for us to get off of our addiction to it. And we're going to have to recognize that we cannot have exponential growth. We can't keep growing the economy 3% per year. You know, economists have to recognize that, you know, we're hitting limits. And the author uh, thinks that we're not going to voluntarily step away from these limits, there's going to be a crash unavoidable. And then we'll have to rethink how society pulls out of that at the other end. Thank you. I I liked that example as well. As I was reading that example about human labor versus a barrel of oil, one of my thoughts was, wow, talk about the worth of a person. (laughs) You know, it's like, we're not worth much then, are we? But it also had me sort of yearning for the day, what they used um, milking a cow as an example, it kind of had me, you know, yearning for the day of when people actually did milk cows. But, you know, there's probably some foolishness in that. Would I want to get up at five in the morning to milk a cow in the freezing cold and perhaps forego reading and comfort with my heated room and my Kindle book? Yeah, there's a reverie in that, that it's probably quite false. At the same time, yeah, how can you give up oil when it produces so much that we rely on? It's it's a really, after reading this, I found it to be really, we're in a quandary. We're in a quandary. And along with that, another quote that I liked from the paper is, and I'll read it, in modern resource-rich culture, the wanting becomes a stronger emotion than the having. And I found this to be quite powerful. This is the basis of our advertising industry. You don't necessarily need to have something. The job of the advertiser is to create the sense of lack so that you can therefore fulfill the lack you didn't know you had with the product that they have to sell you. It's really amazing how our our modern economy knows how to work with the modern brain that is really kind of bereft. And it's actually quite sad that we want much more than we can even need. There's a saying that I have, I don't remember who said it. He who wants little 
has much. So, you know, it's like, if you don't really want a lot of things, you're going to be happy. But our society doesn't want that. We don't want people to be happy with little. Uh, as a matter of fact, these people, I, I mean, in, in the United States, you know, the minimalist, I, I think that whole thing has gone by the wayside, but the whole minimalist movement, those people were called like communists, anti-American, anti-capitalist. It's a very negative thing to be happy with what you have. So it's an interesting, it's an interesting thing. I would love to hear Peter's reaction. Noam Chomsky, right? He's still alive, more than kicking. Uh, yesterday, I read an article that he wrote about machine learning and AI, and it was absolutely brilliant. And I was reminded by the fact that very recently, the climate change experts are using machine learning. Now, of course, I don't understand any of that stuff, but I, um, Noam Chomsky uh, made a lot of sense. I bring up Noam Chomsky because, um, uh, to me, you know, he, he wrote this book and he made this a documentary called Manufacturing Consent, which was great. It was a sort of follow-up to uh, Engineering Consent, which is a whole other very interesting, different story. But it gave birth to what you already referred to, which is Madison Avenue and the advertising industry. So the advertising industry is a multi, multi, multi-billion dollar industry. It decides what we're going to do. A whole lot more than we decide what we're going to do, even individually or as a group. Chomsky explained to me that basically we've been socially engineered and we need to wake up to the fact that we have been. And uh, so who's running the show, right? Well, most people, you know, the so-called average person on the street would, would know that it's the big banks, right? It's the big fossil fuel industries. But behind the big fossil fuel industries, it's the big banks. Uh, they decide what happens. They pull all the strings. I think we have a we have a, a, a huge problem in our technology, and of course, you know the um, the article um, the paper goes a lot into the technology. I, I think that as a culture and a society, we make a huge mistake when as, as soon as science comes across something new and it gets technologicalized and some new technology comes out, we just fall into it. So as I see it, we have two things which are determined how we behave. One is what's called economics. I don't think we actually have an economy because an economy is a, is a rational distribution of goods and services within a community, within a world, or within a country. And, and we don't have that. I mean, we're going um, far, far more uh, disparate. And that leads to uh, conflict and uh, anxieties and depressions. And like you said already, we don't feel as happy as we could be feeling. Those would be my, my thoughts on how are we going to stop and change immediately so that we as a, and this is the thing that really scares me the most, so that we would leave for all today's children, all future generations, right? What's now being called a liv livable planet, for heaven's sake, right? So a culture and a society which really isn't interested, right, in leaving behind a livable planet, we've way lost our way. Thank you so much, Peter. Uh, what you said so much resonated, and I'm looking forward to closing out with Paul. So 800 billion, uh, the U.S. military budget. All we need is the top three billionaires to pool their money, and they have that type of cash. The income inequality you know, now, today, I think that far exceeds probably any other point, in, you know, any point in history in terms of the power. And there's psychological studies that show that the more power and money that you have, your brain actually changes. There's actually brain damage at the front of the brain and you lose mirror, what are called mirror neutrons. So when you're sitting down having a coffee with somebody in person, if it's a really good conversation, we all know the feeling of connection, you know, feel like you're really connecting to a person. And actually it's these mirror neurons in, in both um, people that it's almost like there's communication. And if I go and move my arm this way, the other person might move their arm that way, right? There's actually subconscious mirroring going on. It's a very fascinating research from functional magnetic resonance imagers of the brain. You know, the pandemic didn't help because you don't have the same effects on Zoom, on a Zoom call. Zoom needs to have 3D, you know, with, you know, enhance the technology. So it's like you're really across from the person. It's interesting. So the net result is that as you get wealthier and more powerful, I'm talking to these billionaires, they lose the empathy for 
other people. They they start to think of that they're somehow superior to other people, and you know they start to think of well, the planet's going down. Do we try to save the planet? You know, I thought maybe they would. Maybe some of them are trying, arguably, but they want to escape places. They want to escape from the hordes of people, from the rest of the people, because with a lack of food, say, just for several days to a week, lack of water, lack of electricity, we really do go back into the Stone Ages. It's becoming more mainstream to attract people to actually consider these, the end game, the, the collapse of organized societies. So the paper was actually, you know, it tried to say, well, these are some of the things behind our society, you know, based on how civilizations developed. The, the things that we ignore are the importance of energy in our whole system. And it's getting harder and harder to extract energy from the earth. You know, you have to put more and more energy into the extraction. So they call it the ROI or return on investment is lower and lower and lower in order to sustain the, the GDP growth, et cetera. Many countries around the world have just been, many central banks have just been printing money and there's no basis behind. Before, years ago, when they printed money, there would be something in the vault, gold or something backing the currency that was being printed. But that went way out of favor and now they just print and print and print and then they can spend that money that builds up and builds up. It'll never be paid back. You know, a lot of that debt will, will never be paid back. You know, the money is just created and it gives us an illusion that everything is fine. We have enough energy. You know, the U.S. energy production peaked. The oil, the barrels per day peaked in about the 70s or 80s, but it's actually come back and surpassed that peak. And it's because of all the tight oil. It's the oil that's being extracted directly from rock at very, very high cost. It's not sustainable. Nothing we're doing right now on the planet is sustainable. We have exponential growth, despite all of the climate conferences, et cetera, where record high CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We're seeing weather patterns disrupted all over the world. We're heading to food scarcity, food shortages, and water shortages. And when we go shortly into the next El Nino state, if it's a super El Nino, we're going to be pushing about 1.5 degrees Celsius above the 1880 to 1910 average. And the turmoil around the world is just going to, to rapidly accelerate. So we can't continue this. It's going to end this growth, whether we like it or not. And it looks like we're heading towards a collapse to end it, you know, not sort of a human thought out designed way to end it. Thank you very much to all our listeners. Uh, very, very interesting paper. It's open source. Just have a look at it and let us know what you think in, in the comments section. Yeah, I would definitely really like to hear what y'all have to say. I would like to close with this quote that I found very interesting about the human psyche. And he said, we have great intentions for the future until the future becomes today. Our neocortex can imagine them, but we are emotionally blind to long-term issues like climate change or energy depletion. Emotionally, the future isn't real. So I think it's very important for us to know that about ourselves so that we can make it real because it will be real and it is real. And the time that we spent together was real tonight. So I wanna thank you all so much for joining us here with the Climate Emergency Forum. And we look forward to seeing you next time.